So I have Jun Takahashi here to present an SU2 symmetric semi-definite programming hierarchy for quantum max tests. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Jun. Uh, thanks for being here for the talk. Um, and th I thank the organizers for this nice opportunity. And this work was done in collaboration with um, <clears throat> Chaitanya Rayudu and Sumo Cho from University of New Mexico and Robbie King there uh, from Caltech and Kevin Thompson and Ojas Parrick. Ojas is over there from Sandia National Labs. And I, this was done while I was still at University of New Mexico. I recently moved to University of Tokyo. And um, here we go. So we already had a, a nice talk by you know, Lee about quantum max code. So I don't really need to introduce the um, computer science side of it, I guess, but um, I can still motivate why it's an, an interesting problem from the physics side, because I come from condensed matter physics background. So in condensed matter physics, this is known as the Heisenberg model, and it's actually used very often because um, <clears throat> it models a lot of different materials. And physicists are usually interested in the case where the underlying graph is a periodic uh, structure, so some kind of a lattice, and you're usually interested in the thermodynamic limit, which means the infinite size limit and how the ground state converges to some kind of a phase of matter. And obviously the hardness of obtaining the ground state or what it looks like, it depends on what kind of graph you're considering, but, and it's actually pretty easy to get, no, understand what the ground state is for the square lattice case. But once you introduce these, you know, slightly more complicated lattices, it's actually up to this day um, controversial of what in terms of what kind of ground state it actually holds. And for example, people don't understand if there is a quantum spin liquid state in these kind of models. And uh, physicists do have you know, um, usual tools that they use in order to probe the ground states and thermal states of these models, namely quantum Monte Carlo and tensor networks. But they, all, they both have some shortcomings. They're, they're not applicable to all kinds of materials. Or um, yeah, this has the sign problem. The tensor network doesn't really work well for higher dimensional systems. And we want to shed light into this problem. So physicists know empirically that this is a hard problem because they've been arguing for decades, but um, we have com um, computational complexity theory in hand. So we want, we want to uh, see it from that, that point of view. So uh, like you know, already did, uh, 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 we, we can first look into the classical case because in classical complexity theory, uh, the same Hamiltonian without the x, x, and y, y terms, so just the diagonal part, this becomes the um, max gut problem or the antiferromagnetic Ising model. And for the max gut problem, we know very well that obtaining the ground state is NP hard, but the story doesn't end there. And we furthermore know that the celebrated Gomes and Williamson algorithm gives you an approximate ground state with this 87% approximation ratio. So that's really nice. But even nicer is that if you ask for anything epsilon better than this approximation ratio, then code proves that it is impossible to do that in polynomial time, assuming these p equals n, p does not equal np, and the unique games conjecture. So there's a really clear threshold in the classical case at this 87% value. And the quantum Heisenberg model, you can view it as the quantum counterpart of this classical max gut, and that's why we call it the quantum max gut in this um, computer science uh, context, we can exactly ask a natural question. So is there a similar phase transition-like behavior in terms of the hardness of approximation in the quantum case? But before asking this very fundamental question, we can already ask a more down-to-earth question. For example, how well does the semi-definite programming for the quantum case do? But before even asking this question, we can even ask a more down earth question. What even is the quantum counterpart of the classically um, optimal SDP algorithm? Because when you, once you get to the quantum case, uh, you have this degree of freedom of different bases and stuff. So <clears throat> it's not even uh, well-defined or it's not empirically clear uh, a priori what is the natural semi-definite programming for the quantum case. So, <clears throat> Uh, that's actually what we do in uh, this work. So we come up with what we claim to be the most natural semi-definite um, semi program for 
the Heisenberg model or the quantum Maxka case, and we prove some good properties about it. And we also demonstrate and observe, numerically observe that it also has um, more interesting features as well. So that's the pitch. And before getting into the details of what we do, I first want to quickly recap what the classical um, goldman's williamson optimal algorithm does. So the Hamiltonian looks like this for the classical case, zi and zjs. These are just plus and minus one observables. So um, with this convention, we have this strange two and one over it just to make that each individual term is always zero or one. So that makes a nice convention. And in this convention, we can trivially have the upper bound of the energy that is exactly zero. And we know that the ground state energy, the minimum energy for this whole thing should be minus M with some integer M. So now we know that the gra true ground state looks like this plus and minus ones. But what the SCP does actually is that it first gets a fake solution. So <clears throat> um, in general, I I'm schematically drawing this like this. So you know, all the spins are not necessarily just plus or minus ones anymore. It's, it's some sort of a fake state. It's an unphysical state, but in that extended space of configurations that include these fake spaces, uh, fake states, it's actually easier to obtain the minimal energy uh, fake state within that extended subspace. That's the whole point of semi-definite programming. So, and the cool thing is that you can actually guarantee that this fake optimal solution is not so far away from this minus M. It's at most this percent bigger. Now, the nice thing that Gomez and Williamson, Go, Gomez and Williamson, sorry, um, uh, found out is that from this fake solution, they were able to have a nice rounding, which is um, a way to project this fake state into a true plus and minus state. And because this was not so far away from the true value, they could also um, prove that this um, energy won't be too, too far away from the true ground state value. So this is what the classical um, uh, Goldman's and Williamson algorithm does. And Yuno's uh, new result was mainly coming up with this nicer rounding and having a nice way to analyze their rounding scheme. What we're trying to do is come up with a nice semi-definite programming that does the first part. So uh, what is the semi-definite programming really doing in the classical case? I first want to explain that using this example. So if you have five bits and a graph like this, the Hamiltonian looks like this, or the cost function looks like this. And let's say that you're encoding the true solution as um, a five dimensional vector with plus and minus ones. So this is not a Hilbert space element. This is just a plus and minus one vector in 5D. But um, if you take the outer product of this, what you're gonna get is what we call the moment matrix. So this moment matrix will encode all the um, correlations or moments up to degree two. And the nice thing about this is that because of this construction, you can always guarantee that this has to be positive semi-definite, meaning that you, you, you never have a negative eigenvalue of this thing. And if you look at this moment matrix for a while, you notice that, hey, everything that comes into this um, cost function actually also shows up in this moment matrix. So you can turn this whole thing around and come up with a semi-definite programming problem, meaning that you want to um, minimize. So sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm getting rid of this minus sign and writing maximize just to save space here. But anyway, you want to minimize the summation of these uh, elements in your matrix that has to be positive semi-definite. And this basically corresponds to some sort of a similar optimization problem to the nor, uh, original problem. And you should notice, you can notice that the diagonal elements here are all ones because it originally corresponds to things like zi squared. And zi's have to be plus and minus ones in the original problem. So they have to square to one and we're taking that into account. And in the true moment matrix, everything, because everyone is plus or minus one, everything has to be plus or minus one basically but we're not imposing that here because imposing that will make this optimization problem very hard to solve. But if we allow any kind of real number here, then this whole thing is actually polynomial time computable. That's semi-definite programming. So we just run that. And hopefully if everything is something like 0.9 or minus 0.8, you know, if they're close to plus and minus ones, we can interpret this as some sort of a low energy state. 
And that's what that's essentially what Goldman and William Simmons is doing. So, <clears throat> okay, we have this moment matrix. This moment matrix plays the central role in uh, classical semi-definite programming. And if you look at this, you can notice that um, each rows and columns, they're labeled by ZIs. So from Z1 to Z5 in our example. And you can actually um, imagine a larger moment matrix that also contains um, rows and columns corresponding to higher order moments like Z1, Z2 and stuff. And that will contain a more intricate or more fine-grained information about the state you're trying to get. So it corresponds to a better approximation. And that's exactly what this Lazar hierarchy is. And basically, if you contain everything, all the moments up to the kth degree or k body terms, that's called the kth level of the Lazar hierarchy. So in this case, because we only have one body terms as the as the labelings of rows and columns, it's the level one Lazar hierarchy. And people have been thinking about the, the quantum version of this. Basically, what you need to do is just say, okay, we're now regarding these labels, ZIs, as the Pauli ZIs. And we're going to have rows and columns also corresponding to Xs and Ys. And also, that's, that's going to be the level one. So for level two, we're going to have things like X, X1, Z2, and things like that, like, like these terms. And that's going to correspond to another quantum hierarchy, which is called the NPA hierarchy. And it, it's based on the Pallies. So people have been uh, thinking about using this quantum NPA hierarchy for the quantum max gut. And people have gained um, you know, nice low, uh, bounds for the approximation ratio. But what we're going to, what I'm going to explain now is that this hierarchy itself doesn't really um, suit the problem we are trying to tackle, actually, or we have a more natural um, hierarchy. And okay, this is something uh, you know already explained. So I'm just going to quickly go through. If you look at the quantum max good, so again we we have this strange uh, coefficient of four and one just to make that um, the lowest and largest energy uh, or eigenvalues are zero and one. So that means this is actually a projector. Um, and it's a projector to this singlet state. So we're just going to write the singlet projector as Hij. And <clears throat> this singlet state is a maximally entangled state. So when you have a graph like this, it's already kind of non-trivial because this edge is saying that they, it wants a singlet here and this edge wants a singlet there. But um, because of monogamy of entanglement, that can't happen simultaneously. So what ends up being the ground state is a superposition of these two states. And this leads to the non-trivialness of this problem, even when the graph is bipartite, because uh, you can have these uh, singlet pairs on play between these qubits that are not even connected directly with the, um, <clears throat> uh, on the graph, and a non-trivial coefficient. And I'm stressing this point because uh, for bipartite graphs, in the classical case, you already have um, uh, the, the problem becomes trivial. So the problem is non-trivial for the quantum case, even on bipartite graphs. That's a, one big difference um, in, the, in the quantum case. So in the quantum case, um, <clears throat> we can look into even simpler cases, which, is, which are the star graphs that um, <clears throat> we also talked about in the previous talk. And uh, the thing is, the level one hierarchy for the quantum cases with Pauli's, it fails to obtain these um, energies as well, which is not immediately super bad per se, but it does contrast very sharply with the cl classical case, because for the classical case, um, the case with bipartite, bi bipartite graphs is not only trivial, it's also um, actually already exactly solvable using the SDP. So although semi-definite programming answers are supposed to be lower bounds of the true energy, um, for the classical cases with bipartite graphs, it already matches exactly with the uh, true ground state energy. So level one classical Lazar hierarchy was already enough for these trivial cases. Whereas for the quantum case, the level one project, uh, uh, level one Pauli does fail for even these most trivial cases. So that's one reason to believe the Pauli um, hierarchy is not really nice in terms of 
tackling the, the, <clears throat> the, the quantum exit problem. So what we come up with in our work is we observe that the Hamiltonian here is actually SU2 symmetric. <clears throat> so we can actually come up with a moment matrix that simply uses these H values and the, their, their moments as the elementary, elementary degree of freedom. So the level one in this new hierarchy has all the one body terms of H ij. So it, it's gonna have H12, H13, et cetera. And for the level two, it's gonna have things like H ij, H j k, et cetera. So this new hierarchy, what we show is that uh, when you look at it, um, sorry. So one thing you notice is that previously, um, because you had Pauli's, um, because all Pauli's square to one, uh, all the diagonals had to be one exactly. Um, now we have projectors, so that point becomes a little different. Because you have a projector, when you square it, it becomes itself. So meaning that now the constraint is going to look like, okay, this thing has to equal this thing because this is just the square of that. And we also have commuting terms when the, the, the subscripts don't have any overlaps. And we finally have this non-trivial um, relation between singlet projectors when they do have an overlap. And this also ends up being some sort of a linear relation between what you have in this moment matrix. So you can, again, put this into an SDP format. And we, sh we can prove that all you need are these three relations in order to have convergence. Again, we can prove that when you have large enough, um, <clears throat> okay, sorry, I, I might've skipped this, but, um, uh, just like in the classical case, we can prove that when you go to high enough degree, uh, the hierarchy converges to the true uh, ground state value, which means that we can view even the level one as a first order approximation for, um, for a systematically uh, uh, better approximation uh, family. So with this hierarchy, we can show that already at level one, it gets all the weighted star graphs right. So in some sense, we can say that we, we, we reprove entanglement of monogamy, monogamy of entanglement from the SDP point of view. And in order to do that, uh, I'm not gonna go through the proof, but it's, it has a nice geometric reinterpretation, which I think is nice. And um, we also can prove exactness for some uh, families of graphs, like the complete bipartite graphs. And the interesting case is when uh, you have a complete graph where, so you, when you have all to all connected uniformly graph, then uh, if the number of qubits is even, then we can prove that level one gets it exact. And for odd number of qubits, it always give, gives this three over eight error for some reason, and which we can prove for level one. And um, so there's a big difference for, in terms of parity for, for the uh, complete graph case, which, Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> running out of time. So, um, which brings us to the question of what it, how it performs for general cases, like the, um, <clears throat> for example, we can look into the Heisenberg chain case, which is just a one dimensional cycle. And here <clears throat> we can prove, uh, we actually, so the nice thing about just even just looking at the semi definite programming solution is that we can calculate all sorts of observables from the moment matrix, because that's, although that's not a true state, it has information about all the correlations. So what we find is that the correlation function decays in the right way um, in the thermodynamic limit. So in, from a physics perspective, it's somehow capturing the C equals one conformal field theory exponent correctly, although it's not getting the exact solution. So it can capture some physics, right? And if we go on to see, um, <clears throat> cases where we have um, next nearest neighbor interactions, then if we plot the energy uh, we get from SCP and the true energy, we even see this point where it gets the solution exactly correct. And that this point actually corresponds to the point where it's called the Majimder Gauss point, where we can compute by hand the exact ground state being this kind of state. So there's some uh, connection between these things and we can further calculate uh, go on to see what happens for the um, these controversial cases and measure these order parameters that physicists usually look into and even get phase diagrams saying that uh, this part is 
antiferromagnetic. This is balanced bond solid state. This is the dimer state. And the coolest thing is that we even can observe um, with SDP solutions, a place where none of the order parameters are non-zero, which means that we seem to be capturing quantum spin liquid states, which physicists are all looking into or searching for. And okay, I guess I'm running out of time. So yeah, I, I, I'll just briefly just mention that we can also show that this particular property of frustration freeness and exact uh, that physicists call, what physicists call frustration freeness and our SDP solvability actually exactly coincides. And we can, we argue, we show that in our paper. And we, so we can um, view our algorithm as a algorithmic way to detect those frustration free models. And yeah, this is just another um, thing, a quick glance at how we prove the convergence for finite um, uh, levels. And basically it reduces to showing this kind of crazy formulas um, between the singlet projectors and <clears throat> um, yeah, the, the hardest one was to prove this one, but once you prove this thing using uh, only the three uh, basic uh, formulas we use in SDP, then we can prove that it converges to the correct thing. And yeah, here's the final slide and thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. Um, so these outer approximations are uh, used sort of all over condensed matter and um, computational physics. Um, the interesting thing to know is that when you have this smaller algebra for your SOS, how does that compare to the sort of attendant size poly algebra form? So like the equivalent NPA level, right, right, is right. it better or worse? Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. So this actually, I think, kind of almost exactly answers your question. So this is the um, demonstration for the cycle cases. So I'm plotting the energy versus system size here. Uh, the red thing is the true ground state energy. And, you know, I have two lines because the even and odd cases oscillate kind of bad. So I just draw two lines for even and odd cases. And you can see that the, the ground state energy estimates from uh, using level two Pauli um, is definitely closer to the true value. The, that's the green line. Uh, so um, the, it's closer to the red line than the blue line, which is the um, semi level one projector, singlet projector, semi, our um, hierarchy. But uh, so, but the point is actually this, this line, this is, this green line stops here because um, the SDP program, although it's um, theoretically polynomial time, it's actually very much impractical. So you, you need to stop here. You can't do any system sizes larger than that. And that's actually even smaller than exact diagonalization. Whereas with our SDP, we can actually probe to much, much larger system sizes, which actually is the, the requirement in order to use it for anything like um, doing computational physics. So with the previous yeah, things, people weren't able to really do anything like computational physics at all, but our um, hierarchy allows you to do that. I think a couple of years ago, Gil Raphael at Caltech had a local version of this where the algebra is just local sites mm. um, instead of the entire algebra mm -hmm. that spans mm -hmm. the entire lattice. Right, and I think right. it also had very good performance. And I so see. that would save you. Here. Right. I'm not sure if they had convergence proof though. I'm yeah. sure they, they did not. <laughs> okay. Okay. They, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Just a question of maybe a clarification and question. So I understood that what you are doing is that you are replacing the Paulis, right, with some SU two invariant uh, algebra. Yes. Which are these uh, single projectors, right? Yes. Okay. Maybe actually following up on what was asked. So uh, you can generate right any um, projector, I guess, uh, starting from uh, the and uh, local ones, right? One, two, two, three, three, four, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. That's enough to, so w once you have a line, yeah. uh, in principle with the combinations of those and multiplying those, 
then you can get uh, the different ones as yeah. well. Okay, but here, I guess uh, at level one, you want to take all the different possible pairs. Right, right, Otherwise right. To... Okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I think even if you do it, like starting from that and defining that as level one, and then having next nearest neighbor connecting ones as level two, et cetera, then eventually that kind of hierarchy should also converge to the right thing, I think. But um, uh, yeah, that's simply not what we did here. And that would also not necessarily, like it, it won't be as kind of potentially practical as our thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe just a clarification. So mm -hmm. uh, do you understand correctly that uh, you have a um, polynomial time algorithm to uh, provably correct to compute, uh, um, say, the uh, correlation functions uh, in SU2 invariant chains. Is it, is it no? So, sorry, is, sorry, could you, could you say that again? So we have an SDP, right? So yes. we know we can solve it. But I guess, uh, what did you prove? I guess you proved that the level one was uh, correct for certain observables or? Right, so, so what we prove here is that uh, it, it's actually enough or it gets exactly the correct answer for this uh, family of graphs. Which includes the bipartite graphs. Uh, which what? includes the star graphs. So okay. th this is an even smaller subset of so bipartite graphs. So no, bipartite- Not even chain. Uh, on the chain, we don't have that. Oh, okay. So, or as a matter of fact, we know that it doesn't get it right, but it somehow gets the critical exponent, which is like one number yeah, that physicists observables. care about. Yeah. Uh, it, at least numerically, we can see that it's kind of getting okay. it right. So that, that's, that's actually a big mystery here. Um, in some sense, you can say that level one, sum of squares or, or SDP is capable of capturing a, an approximate C equals one conformal field theory. But like, you know, that that's just rephrasing this, this observation in some yeah, sense. Just for this observable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have timed my thing a bit better. So frustration three models are in physics, they're basically defined as models where the ground state is a simultaneous ground state of all the um, individual terms in the Hamiltonian. And this particular case with uh, weights one and two are known to be that. But if you actually look at the ground state, that's not literally true because H I I plus one, that's something like this. This bond, for example, is not satisfied. But if you rewrite the Hamiltonian like this, now this whole thing with three terms is actually a projector into a, into a specific thing. So, um, you know, frustration free comes with a particular way of rearranging the terms. And it's not always very clear. So maybe just because a given Hamiltonian doesn't look like it's frustration free, maybe there's a clever way to re rearrange everything. But what we show basically is that out using our algorithm, we can always detect if there is such a thing within some asterisk with, with some conditions. But Wait, so, what's, what's that so it's that uh, this projector can be written as a low degree polynomial. Of, of singlet projectors, so these H's. So yeah, th that degree exactly corresponds to the degree that we're using for the SDP. And right now we're just, you know, we just played around with level one and in principle you can go to level two. So you can say, oh, this model is actually not frustration free for level one, but it becomes frustration free for level two. That kind of thing can happen. We can, in some sense, I, I think we can say that our algorithm lets you qua quantify how frustration free a system is. <clears throat> and I think that's pretty cool. Thank you for the question. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thanks so much. Thank you.